My name's Dr Catherine White. I'm the Medical Director for the Institute for Addressing Strangulation. Strangulation is where pressure is applied to the neck, which could block off airflow in the windpipe, but also could block off the circulation. The thing that makes strangulation so dangerous can be broken down into different elements. So there's the immediate um, danger of death, which can happen very rapidly. It can also cause problems, not precisely at that time, but that can happen rapidly afterwards. If you think about the blood vessels in the neck, they can be damaged um, during the strangulation. So particularly if they're stretched or twisted, then what happens is you get little tears inside the blood vessels. And what the body tries to do is repair the tear, and so you get blood clot formation. Now, if any of that blood clot breaks off, then you get strokes. So actually, there's some evidence that in women under the age of 40, strangulation is the second uh, most likely cause of a young woman to have a stroke. There's also very good evidence that if a woman has had a history of somebody putting their hand on her neck, as in strangulation, then she is seven times the risk of becoming a homicide victim later on, and six times the risk of being an attempted homicide victim. So strangulation is dangerous immediately to the victim, in the long term to the victim, but also should be seen as a red flag for future lethality. I think the incentive behind strangulation by an assailant will um, vary, but um, from what we tend to see, a lot of them it's control. So we see it in coercive control. It's a very effective way of terrifying somebody and making them compliant, making them do what you want them to do. There are different kinds of strangulation. One of the methods that we see the most is manual strangulation, so strangulation by hands. Another method that we see fairly frequently is a headlock or a chokehold. So that's where the attacker is behind the victim and they wrap their arm around the front of the victim's neck and squeeze, uh, putting pressure on the front of the victim's neck. We also see ligatures, so that might be the clothing that the person is wearing. It might be something different. It might be a, a belt or a piece of rope that is used to strangle them. Other methods are hanging um, as well, but we, uh, in the interpersonal violence, so that's where you have an attacker um, uh, attacking a victim, we don't see that as much. Well, we don't really know the full answer to the question, how often does strangulation occur? But there are some things that we do know. A global survey um, looking at how often it happens with women estimated it occurred between three and 10% of women at some point in their lifetime will be a victim of strangulation. If we speak to people working in domestic abuse charities about women who've gone for help to them, then it can go up to 40% of the women will give a history of strangulation. Thinking about sexual violence, in a study done in Manchester, women coming through, and it was mainly women, coming through um, following an allegation of rape or sexual assault, one in 11 gave a history of strangulation as part of that sexual assault. And if the alleged rapist was a partner or ex-partner, then it was one in five. One of the things that we know about strangulation is that it's a gendered crime. Most of the victims are female. Most of the assailants are male. 
That is not to say that men can't be strangled. That is not to say that women might not strangle, but overwhelmingly uh, it's women, females who are victims, and males who are the aggressors.